All right, we're in John chapter 8. You knew that. Or maybe you didn't remember. It's been gone so long. Where, where was I? You might be interested. I, we went to uh, first week. I was supposed to do a whole lot of projects around the house. I was so tired, I sat and stared at the wall. <laughs> I did, and it felt good. Uh, second week, we went down to Arizona to see our son and daughter-in-law. They live down in Phoenix. And uh, spent some wonderful time with them. And then the third week, we, we rent a cabin. Mary and I rent a cabin over in Priest Lake, Idaho. One of the most beautiful lakes in the world, I think. And uh, we invite our family, anyone who will come. And we just bundle everybody into a little old cabin. And uh, we, this time we uh, didn't get everybody, but we had nine of us uh, in there. And we just, just sit in the sand and go swimming and maybe rent a boat a, d a day or two and, and just have a wonderful time together and just uh, enjoy that. So that's what we were doing. Thank you for the vacation. It was a great gift. All right. John chapter 8, verse 31. Father, would you open our ears? We want to hear from Jesus. Would you open our eyes to see what he's saying and understand the things of God? And we would bring you soft hearts, that that which is true and that which is yours, Lord, we would respond to and obey. I would, we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is in Jerusalem. This is the last six months of his life before he is crucified and then resurrected. I don't mean life in a long sense. He... Um, we are in the fall of the year, probably October. We've just, just gone through the Feast of Booths, which can often be like the first week of October, second week of October, but it varies. And they've gone through that, that and we've had uh, the, the, the eighth day of that week, which is Simcha Torah, a day of celebration of starting the Torah reading all over again for the new year. Uh, that was the day before when he said, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Today, he's back in the temple area. He's in that very uh, court of the women, right? In the central, center part of the temple. And he's surrounded by a crowd, but this crowd is very heavily uh, religious leaders. You've got members of the Sanhedrin, you've got priestly uh, people, and you've got Pharisees. And some of the top Pharisee leaders, I think, are there. That would be, today, we call them the ultra-Orthodox. Uh, but you've got this strong Jewish uh, community around him, and he's preaching to them. And something remarkable happens. I'll start at verse 28, at chapter uh, John 8. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Or I am, is all he says. That he's added. And I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. Who, who knows what he meant when he said, when you lift up the Son of Man? What's the term lift up? Crucify. Yeah, that's what they understood, too. So he's, he's, he's saying, when you, when you lift me up on, on a, on a uh, cross, when I am crucified, and you watch how I die, and you watch how I surrender to the will of God, you will know my submitted heart. Because they're accusing him of being an ambitious religious uh, uh, rabbi, of kind of rising up and, and trying to gather a crowd around him, that kind of thing. That's where they're going at it, their attack on him. And he says, when I'm crucified, and he will be within, within six months, he says, when I'm crucified, when you see me lifted up, you're going to know my heart. And you're going to know that I am fully submitted and do all that I do and say all that I've said because the Father has instructed me. And he, verse 29, and he who sent me is with me, the Father. And he has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he spoke these things, look at this, many came to believe in him. Say many. many. Isn't that amazing? There in the center of the temple, there surrounded by, by religious leaders, many came to believe in him. Would you please notice it wasn't because of a miracle? Now, within, within uh, 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 that six-month period toward the end, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. That, and that, they all know Lazarus, too. And that does cause a stir, and huge numbers do believe because of that miracle. But right now, there's no miracle. What did he just say? He just said, when you crucify me and you watch how I die, you'll know I'm the Son of God. And many believed. Many believed in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews, and when he uses that term, we're not talking about the Jewish people at large. We're talking about religious leaders. Saying to those Jews who had believed him, 
If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Would you read his saying out loud? If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Let's do it again. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Let's say that. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I'll go on. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Did you see that? Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Let's say verse 36. If the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. All right, let's look at our discussion guide. Forgiveness, we're talking about truth that frees. Forgiveness is a wonderful gift. Who among us is not grateful that God mercifully forgives our sins? Forgiveness means that he will not punish us when we sin, though our sin may have set in motion forces that will bring much misery. It means he does not withdraw his presence from us, though from our side of the relationship, our hearts may grow harder and God may seem more distant. It means Jesus will not hold that sin against us when we stand before him on that day when he evaluates our lives. It means in spite of the sins we have committed, we will be resurrected when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom on earth. That is good news. But it's not the best news. The best news is that Jesus has made it possible for us to stop sinning. His death and resurrection have not only released forgiveness, they have released the power which can set us free from doing things that need to be forgiven. It can break the terrible grip sin has had on us. And that is the best news because obedience to God is the key to success and happiness. Do you understand that? We have a culture. The American church right now is just awash in the message of grace. And, and who, who can argue with grace? But the idea is that God just so loves you just the way you are. And the ultimate underground message in that is, and he really doesn't care if you change. It's okay with him. It'd be nice. But if you don't, whatever. That's not true. Sin brings death. Always. Every sin brings death. We are not, this is not, a, this is not some kind of mild theology, theological issue of God's okay with us. That's not it. The way to blessing, the way to peace, the way to have our lives emerge into the plan and purpose God has for us is through obedience. Obedience to his word. Jesus said, if you, what? Remain in my word. Meaning the things I'm teaching you, the things I'm commanding you. If you remain in those, you will be my disciples. Then you will be my disciples. And he said, and, the, and, and, he said and, the, and, and, the, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then they go, what freedom? And they begin to argue with him. What was the freedom? It was freedom from sin. That's what he went on to say. The Bible says sin produces death. The wages of sin is Death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It always does in one form or another. Every time I sin, I damage something or someone. I release death into that situation, and the damage it causes usually can't be undone by forgiveness. Do you realize that you can say, God, I'm so sorry I did that, and he will forgive you. But you still may well have damaged someone or set something into motion that cannot be reeled back just because you're forgiven. You have released a monster, and it's on its way. Now, he'll be with you and guide you. He will not leave you. But you still can do stuff that just cannot be just fixed. Have you found that out? Yes. Yeah. So the good news isn't that we're forgiven. I mean, that is good news. But the best news is that I can stop hurting people. <laughs> I can stop saying stupid things. I can, I can stop getting addicted. 
I can stop being in bondage. I can stop losing my temper. I can stop being uh, engaged in, in some kind of pornography and, and, and anger or fear. I can walk out of those things and start living a healthy life. That's the best news. I've released... <clears throat> okay. I, I'll start where I can see. I release death into that situation, and the damage it causes usually can't be undone by forgiveness. I've, I've released a destructive force that must play itself out, though thankfully, because of forgiveness, God is still with me to help me deal with it as constructively as possible. So forgiveness is a wonderful gift, but the freedom to stop sinning is an even better gift. And that's the gift Jesus promised to a group of brand new disciples. He said to them, you will know the truth and the truth will free you. Say that again. You will know the truth and the truth will free you. Now let's discover what those words mean. Because every one of us desperately needs freedom from sin. Would you turn your discussion guide over to your daily Bible study? I'll start on Monday. The fact that he said, if you remain, if you remain in, in my word, tells us that Jesus did not consider an initial burst of faith to be sufficient to qualify someone to be called his disciple. He did not discount the sincerity of new faith, but cautioned those in the crowd who had taken this step that their relationship with him, which began by believing into him. You're going to find people who really attack this passage. They don't like what it says. Uh, it says, there were many who believed, and then the Greek preposition is ace, it's into. They believed into him, which is, which is what everywhere in the New Testament means. They, got, they, they really meant it. They're in. They believed into Christ. Hallelujah. But people don't like that. Because Jesus comes along and says, now, if, you really, if you're going to be mine, you must continue. You see, the once saved, always saved thing gets all out of shape right now because, wait a minute, wait a minute, but you, you just said I had to continue. <laughs> Wasn't that initial faith thing enough? And no, he's saying it isn't. He's saying, I'm really glad for what just happened. Now let's continue. Let's continue. If you're going to be my disciple, remain is the word. Remain in my word, in, in following me. Only those who continued to believe and obey what he taught would be considered his disciples. That he meant, that he meant when he used the, the term disciple, someone who is saved rather than someone who is merely a student becomes evident in the next few verses. He will go on to explain that true disciples hold the role of sonship in God's family. And then he contrasts those sons with slaves who because of their slavery do not remain in God's family Unto the age. What age? The coming age. The age of the Messiah when he arrives and we are resurrected. Tuesday. Those who believe the revelations he was proclaiming about himself and who were willing to submit to him by obeying his teachings, Jesus said would not only receive salvation, but they would discover a truth which would set them free from slavery to sin. He said, you will know the truth about me and what I've made possible for you, and the truth will set you free. But in that statement, he did not specify the truth, pardon me, which is the truth that sets us free. However, in this context, he must be speaking about the truth of who he is and what he's done for us. He said, if someone remains in that truth by continuing to believe and obey, that person will grow in their understanding of that truth, which will bring to them a greater and greater freedom from sin. In effect, he said, obedience to the gospel will lead to a deeper understanding of it, which will lead to a greater freedom from sin. True discipleship will always lead to moral cleanness. You and I are not simply saved and then left the way we are. You know, to sort of crash through life, uh, ruining one thing after another, uh, being ad addicted and being miserable and being angry and being lustful. We are not left to just plow through life like that, but we'll get to heaven because we're forgiven. That is not New Testament Christianity. That's not what Jesus is offering at all. He's saying, you, you have believed into me. Now, if you will remain in my word, if you will listen to what I'm teaching you, if you will believe what I'm proclaiming about myself, 
you will know the truth. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And what he meant was from sin. Now think of this. You're talking about all of these Jewish people. These people who are trying to obey the commands of Torah. And, and how does it work? Well, Paul explains how it works. In Romans chapter 7, he says, I wanted to do this, but I did this. I tried to do this, and I did that. I, I couldn't make myself. I couldn't bring that inner rebellion into line. They're all frustrated. And he's saying to them, you want to obey God, and you're now going to be able to. Because I've provided something that will allow you to obey God and walk in that blessing. Wednesday. When he first made this statement, Jesus didn't identify the specific bondage from which his disciples would be set free. He, he merely said, the truth will free you. That ambiguity allowed some in the crowd to take offense to his statement. They considered the situation that they needed, to be fr needed freedom to be an insult. In effect, they replied, how dare you suggest that we are not free? We are Abraham's seed and have never been enslaved to anyone. It seems certain that those who said this were not those in the crowd who had newly believed. Some people will tell you that is ridiculous. They must have been those who did not believe, and that group was about to enter into a bitter confrontation with him. You'll see in the coming verses. Their claim that those who had descended from Abraham had never been enslaved is so inaccurate. It's hard to grasp what they meant. The sad truth is apparent to anyone who looks back over the history of the nation. Abraham's descendants were often enslaved by oppressive governments. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Syria. In fact, at the time these words were spoken, Israel was enslaved to Rome. The leaders who made that claim may have meant that in spite of the fact they had endured centuries of oppression, true Jews had never renounced their faith. There was always a core of men and women who resisted being assimilated by the godless cultures which dominated them. That's called the remnant in the Old Testament. But even so, it is hard to argue that at least outwardly they'd never been slaves. I'm not going to take you there, but that passage in Nehemiah, it's where Ezra, wonderful Ezra, stands up and he's praying on behalf and repenting on behalf of the whole nation. Everybody's gathered. Ezra stands up and he begins to pray this prayer. In my mind, Ezra is the first Pharisee. He is the, and I mean that in a positive way, he is the one who began saying, we have got to come back to obedience to the word and, and, and not have these curses keep happening to us. Uh, let's, you know, let's quit this stuff, let's start obeying. And uh, he was the scribe and he began to copy and he's gathered, he's the one who gathered all the books of the, of the Old Testament, or the ones he hadn't written yet, uh, and uh, maybe a, a couple of prophets. But he gathered everything else and he's the one who pulled the whole Torah together and the, and the, and the, and the word of God. He stands up and to the Lord on behalf of the nation says, time and again, because of our rebellion, we have become slaves. He uses the word. He says over and over again, he says, we became slaves. And he says, we're slaves now. And it's all because of our disobedience. So the argument that they were never slaves is, is just, I don't know what they were thinking. Anyway, I, they'll have to explain to you. In <laughs> Friday. Jesus immediately clarified his meaning. He said, truly, truly, literally, amen, amen. I tell you that everyone doing sin is a slave of sin. But the slave does not remain in the house unto the age. The son remains into the age. The house of which he speaks is God's household or family. The son is the person who has become a child of God. The slave is the person enslaved to sin and who never discovers freedom from sin. So in, that, in the end, that person is removed from God's house. But Jesus promises his disciples that he will show them a truth which will set them free from all sin. For that to happen, a disciple must learn to escape the appetites and impulses of their flesh, the temptations of the world, and the assaults of the devil. Jesus concluded this teaching on freedom by saying, If therefore the Son freed you. Notice it's in the past tense. If the Son has freed you, you will be free. In, in other words, he will enable each disciple to live in such a way that he or she will continually be free from the control of sin. That person will have the power to escape the enslaving grip of sin, and freedom will be with them for the rest, that freedom will for the rest of their life. And it will apply to every type of temptation and spiritual attack. This, by the way, is the truth Paul explains so profoundly in Romans chapter 6 through 8. 
The apostle bases his entire teaching on that subject on one central truth. As believers, we have been spiritually united with Christ in his death and raised with him in his resurrection. He says, it is because of Christ's death and resurrection that the children of God have been given the power of the Holy Spirit, which enables them to walk free from sin. Let me step away for a second. When we baptize you, we, we stand there in a, in, a, in a tank of water, which represents a watery grave, and we're, we bury you. We, we, we take you and we lower you down as if we're burying you into that water. And we say it as we do it. We say, buried with him into his death. Say that. Buried with him into his death. And raised with him into newness of life. Say that. Raised. Do you notice the words with him? When we do not believe, as Christians, we do not simply believe Jesus died for us. He didn't simply die way back there, and we believe that he did that. There's a far deeper truth. Spiritually, when we put our faith in him, we die with him. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. We are joined to Christ. Paul, well, Paul in, in Colossians has this, these fabulous uh, participles. and In Greek, you can stack all kinds of stuff onto a participle, and he sure does. And he has the term buried together with. It's all one word. Buried together with. And then he has raised together with. All one word. And then he has made alive together with. You and I have been joined with Christ. So when we're buried, you and I are buried into his grave. We die with him. When we, ri when, when we rise, we rise with him. I am, you are, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ... I have died with Christ, and I am right now alive with Christ. In fact, Paul would go on to say, I'm seated in heavenly places with him. I don't, I, I'm glad I'm there. Don't know what that means, but I'm glad I'm there. Hallelujah. That truth is a reality, not a theology. And in the spiritual world, it's as, it's as true as though I were dead and now resurrected. It has already happened, and the power of it is mine now. Let's go on. He says it because of Christ's death and resurrection that the children of God have been given the power of the Holy Spirit, which enables them to walk free from sin. Christ's death and resurrection must therefore be the truth, Jesus said his disciples would know by remaining in his word. Those who understand this truth will discover that it contains power to free us from sin. So at, then an essential part of our discipleship becomes learning to walk in that freedom. Let's go back. True discipleship. The very first thing Jesus told this group of new believers is that their years of frustration over their inability to obey God were over. They would commit themselves to, if they would, he would set them free from being slaves to sin. At last they could stop constantly cleaning up the messes they had created by their disobedience, and discover God's plan for their lives. And he said that the key to that new lifestyle was a particular truth, the truth. Jesus didn't say that all truth tends to free people in one way or another. He didn't make a general philosophical statement about truth. What he said was that his disciples, by remaining in his word, things he teaches and proclaims about himself, would learn a specific truth which would free them from sin. He said they would know the truth, and the truth would set them free. What is that truth? It is the truth, the amazing truth, about the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul knew this truth and said it is the foundation of our new life in Christ. Would you turn to Romans 6 for a minute? I just want you to see this. Romans 6, 7, and 8 is Paul explaining what Jesus just proclaimed. He's explain, he goes through the whole thing. It's, it's, it's all there. L look at verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Notice the past tense. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, 
So we too might walk in newness of life. And then he'll go on to say, look at verse 7. For he who has died is what? Freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And he goes on. And then he, then he orders us in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Verse 11 was, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then tells us, don't, don't give yourself to that. And he says, verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're under law, not under law, but under grace. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Doesn't that sound like what Jesus just said? Either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you become slaves to righteousness. In other words, you begin to serve him with that same commitment. In Romans chapter 6, Paul explained this truth in detail. He said, Jesus did not simply die for us, but in a very real way. If we place our faith in him, when he died, we died with him. You might say we were spiritually present in him as he hung on the cross, so much so that the spirit, in the spiritual world, his death becomes our death. That's why the law of God no longer has the power to curse us. In Jesus, we have already endured the fury of the curse. That's why the devil has no right to demand justice for our sins. We have already been executed for our sins in Jesus. How many times can you kill a person? We're already dead. And, over, and the sin which resides in our bodies has no right to dominate us. Because those bodies have already died with Jesus. They're, they're dead. They don't, have to, they don't respond to that. Paul saw our being joined to Jesus not as something that will happen in the future, but something that is already finished, and its power is available to us now. The process. Jesus said, freedom from sin would come to those who remain in my word. As a disciple continues to struggle, Notice the term, struggle to learn how to obey his commands. He or she undergoes a change of thinking. We cease to think of ourselves as helpless victims. Let me stop here. How often have you thought or I thought that I can't help myself? I'm just out of control. And every one of us, I think, when we begin to try to walk in our obedience to the Lord, we'll have areas when we say, I've got to change the way I talk. I mean, the stuff that comes out of my mouth is not okay. i got to get that clean. I'm just using this theoretically. <laughs> sort of. And we say, okay, I'm going to clean that up. And you go, Jesus, I'm never going to say that again. Until about an hour and a half later. <laughs> right? And you, keep, you go through this exercise of trying to stop. And then you can't. You know, it just doesn't go, you know, how to, how, and you're sincere, and you've got Jesus to take it away, and the whole thing, and you go through this wrestling match with the thing. You are not failing, you are struggling. And in the struggle, Jesus will teach you how. Because you see, it isn't that he's in, uh, not, the power isn't there, it's that you as a, as a, as a, as a young believer, or a, or a person who's really engaging this now, are learning how. Walking in obedience, bringing, bringing our flesh into submission is a skill. That's what's not taught. We often say, oh, you just got the devil. You know? Well, uh, he's involved, but you could have done it without him. <laughs> Haven't you learned that? You know, you, he comes along later. You know, you already started the mess. And so, so it, it's not just the devil, and you're not demon-possessed. And, and it is, all of that kind of is nonsense. And nor are you a phony. No, nor because you fail are you some kind of phony. You are a disciple who's trying to learn how do I lay hold of this power that's been given to me and bring my flesh, and my mind, my thoughts, my words, my actions, how do I bring them into submission to Christ? You can do it. It's there. The power's real. This isn't a bluff. But we've got to, you, you have to, you struggle and you learn. And you'll learn what works for you. 
I'll get to that in, well, right here. <laughs> Our mind is, <laughs> but you're not a victim. Say, I'm not a victim. <laughs> Look, we've all been victimized. Life is such that, uh, you know, if, if you haven't been yet, we'll get to you. You know, we're coming. <laughs> we're all living with humans, and we're all living with imperfect humans and even sinful humans. And so all of us have been victimized, and I don't make light of that. Some of you have been savaged, and it's awful. However, however, you're not a victim. Because you have been, you've died with Christ and risen with Him, and you are now made alive with Him. You are full of the Holy Ghost. If you're in Christ, you have the Spirit of God in you. You are no victim. He, Paul says it this way. He who raised Jesus from the dead... If, if he who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal dying bodies. And he's not talking about the resurrection. He's talking about your power over sin, over those bodies. That's what he's saying. That he, so I have within me a power that took the, a body of Jesus that had been crucified and was dead for three days and went... <laughs> And that body came alive and strong. That's in me, and it's in you. That's greater than any sin or temptation that comes along. And so we're learning to lay hold of that power. And it's a process. It is not a straight line. It is not something we just pray out of you. Oh, God, you know. And it's not going to go like that, a lot of these. It's going to go as you and I learn to lay hold of that power on a regular, daily basis. As our mind is being transformed, we are learning to think like Jesus. As the years pass, we become increasingly free, not because we've discovered new truths, but because we have grown more and more confident in the truth about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each of us learns to lay hold of that truth in practical ways that work for us, so that in time, what may have started as a doctrine becomes a familiar part of our daily life. In situation after situation, we lay hold of the fact that our death and of our death and resurrection and of the power that has come to live within us. And gradually, in area after area, sin loses its power over us. Now hang on. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the grace that is ours because of his death and resurrection provides constant forgiveness. Well, when we fail, it buys us time to learn how to lay hold of the truth. Do you follow what I just said? You and I have grace covering us. I do not in any way diminish grace that, he, that even in my sin I am forgiven and washed. That's what buys me time to learn how to stop sinning. I am not, I, he does not leave me. He does not curse me. He does not grow angry with me. He stays with me now as a father, training me, training a child, tutoring me, not as a judge who finds me guilty and casts me out. Because of Christ, he walks with me. And sometimes those, those learnings can take years and years while we're trying to learn how do I bring that area of my life into submission to him. But while I'm learning, the grace of God covers me. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not, grace is not meant to, hey, just keep on sinning. It doesn't matter. There are actually people who teach you that. Everything you ever did was uh, for, forgiven at the cross. And so it's all forgiven anyway. It really doesn't matter. Just sin your brains out. But what they don't mention is, and meanwhile, while you do that, you'll damage your family, you'll damage your career, you'll damage your calling, you'll, you'll ruin yourself, you'll, you'll release death left and right. Just keep it up because you're forgiven. Great news, great news. Wow, what a message. It's, it's, it's terribly nearsighted. What it is, is cynical. What it is, is cynical. The church of Jesus Christ has not found the power to get free from sin. All they can do is scold you and threaten you, scare the liver out of you and tell you if you don't stop, you'll go to hell or try to cast the devil out of you. And it's not working. And so the church of Jesus Christ is kind of in retreat, going, well, at least we're going to heaven. That's what's happening. That's the, the great message that's out there right now because we've lost this. Jesus says, you will know the truth about what I've done for you. And that truth will set you free. You will be my disciples and you're not going to be in bondage to this garbage anymore. You're going to find your life. Hallelujah. 
Where did I leave off? I have no... Okay, the danger. Oh, good. All sin produces death. But Jesus says it also produces bondage. The more I commit a sin, the harder it is to stop. And at some point, if I, don't, if I continue long enough, I find I can't stop. I, be, I can become enslaved to that sin. That's what he was teaching. That's what Paul just said. It can rule me and make me do things I don't want to do. The, through, though Jesus' death and resurrection never lose their power to forgive me, if I continue to sin, I will find my heart growing hard. I may grow angry at God, blaming Him for my failure to stop because I prayed and He didn't take it away. You know that doesn't work, right? God, take it away. No, He's going to teach you how to lay hold of the power of God and put it to death. Your spirit's going to rule your body, not your body rule you. He's going to teach you that. I may enjoy that sin and resent God's demand that I stop, I may develop a heavy burden of shame that causes me to avoid God and withdraw from His people. And if that isolation and condemnation are not relieved, it is possible for my confidence in the truth to evaporate. My walk with God can decline until it becomes only a memory. Jesus likens that decline to the flame of a lamp slowly extinguishing. God's power to forgive us is infinite. But our capacity to repent is not. Let me say it again. God's power to forgive us is infinite. But our capacity to repent is not. The Bible warns that a line can be crossed from which we are not able to return. No one has the right or ability to declare when this happens in someone else's life or, for that matter, in their own. But the danger is there. And if we are wise, we will recognize the symptoms early and repent quickly. When you know that, there, that the grace of God is, is, is infinite, when the, when the Lord's mercy is there, you are not afraid to confess your sins. You are not afraid to bring them. You don't need to blame your mother. You don't need to blame your father. You don't need to go through any kind of this kind of thing. You can just say, I did it. I'm sorry. It's nasty. And, and just give it to him. We t- are taking communion today. We take it once a month as a congregation. I've actually talked to pastors who say, well, we take it once a year so it doesn't get old. Thinking, well, that, 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 that'll keep it fresh. A um, little understanding would also keep it fresh. Um, I, uh, but you'll notice that every week we put those communion trays across the front. It, it's not magic in, that, in some sort of sense, it, but it's a vivid prophetic image. And so you take the, 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 the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus and you, and, and, and you give him your garbage. You, you know, I, I, how often do I take it? I can easily take it once, twice, even three times on a normal weekend. Just because I'm, sometimes I'm tired and I give him my weariness. Sometimes I've, I've had a, I had a, I've, I've, I'm grumpy and I give him that. Uh, sometimes I've sinned. Sometimes I'm, 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 I've got, just got a lousy attitude. And I'm, I'm giving it to him. And in communion, as I give to him my sin, my sorrow, my sickness, as I give him that stuff, he gives to me life. That's how I, I just keep my heart clean. We keep short accounts with God. Say that. We keep short accounts. Because we have no fear of him he, he, in, in that sense. I mean, we fear sin, we, but our Father is merciful. So we can just keep confessing that stuff, keep bringing it to him, keep unloading. And while I'm doing that, he's teaching me how to stop doing that so that I can not have the death and the damage that those attitudes produce. In... Uh, I, I don't know where I left off. Is, is it in this passage? Yeah. Oh, good. Jesus gives, us, gives both a promise and a warning. The promise is that he has set us free from sin. The warning is that we need to lay hold of that freedom because sin has a dangerous power. It can enslave those who practice it. It tempts us, and then it won't let us go. And if we don't lay hold of the truth to stop that process, it can carry us away from God. So grace does not mean we have been freed to continue sinning. It means we have been given the time to learn how to stop. The best news, here's the best news of all. You and I don't have to keep damaging relationships, losing jobs, 
enduring shame, wasting time, missing opportunities, watching our lives go by without fruit and without meaning. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin is no longer our master. Jesus is. And when we submit to him, he teaches us how to escape addictions, temptations, and lies. He teaches us how to make good choices time after time, in situation after situation, until every area of our life is moving upward. Healing, growing stronger, getting better, becoming full of joy. That is not, uh, that is not simply a platitude. That is truth. When you and I begin to, as we begin to walk with him in submission to these things, begin to learn these things, our life moves upward. I don't care what, I do care, but I mean, I, it doesn't matter what your history is. It doesn't matter how damaged your past is. The, the minute you begin to change the way you think, your life begins to move another trajectory. One of the things with, with water baptism that's so vivid to me, because in water baptism, it's such a clear statement. I am now a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll almost always ask the question, because I sit there, I say, you know, I, have you fully surrendered to Christ? Are you willing to give him the rest of your life and really mean it? And, and they do, and they understand that. And so they're saying, yes, I do. And, and to me, there's this excitement inside going, okay, and now we get to see the real you. Now we get to see what you're like with the power of God, free from that kind of garbage that's been damaging your life. Now we get to discover your, who you are in gifting, in calling, we get to see the fruitfulness of your life. We get to see you under the anointing. Because the real you is the anointed you. It's you full of God. It's you moving in his power. That's the real you. See, I, I think when, when Adam and Eve said it, they're naked, you know what was, you know what was naked? It's not like, I mean, come on, they had been. What was naked was they no longer had Shekinah around them. The light of God was no longer there. They were exposed. And we're meant, you and I have been designed, the human race has been designed to be enclosed in the glory of God. You are designed to be enclosed with the glory of God. You are, when, when you are anointed, that's you. When you are not anointed, when you're in the flesh, when the sin is controlling you, that's, not, that's the broken, damaged thing that the, that the enemy's come to do. You, set free, is the real you. And you're really something else. You're used powerfully, and you're lovely, and you're like Christ. That's the real you. That's what he's come to do, is let us be the real sons and daughters of God. We hear his call to serve him. We recognize the gifts he has given to enable us to carry his love to other people. The old chains that once held us back have been broken. Now, when temptations come, we know how to respond. Let me step in for a second. I know I'm almost done. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> I'm close. Ooh, I am d done too. I've got to quit. I have learned skills. You will learn skills. What do you do when a temptation comes? You know some of the things I do? I've got several things I've learned that are just practical. I'll put them real fast. One of the things when temptation wants to come, I actually, in my mind, picture Jesus. I'm, and it's important. I don't think theologically. I picture him. And I have some pictures he's given me. And I see him. And I just stare at him. I hold my thought on him. And as I do, I can literally feel the temptation let go. I have done that for years. It works. Try it. Try it. You know, here it comes. Don't arm wrestle that temptation. No, in the name of Jesus. It'll wear you down. Just deprive it. Just abandon it. Look at him and let him get rid of it. You see? The power of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. I've learned, I pray in the Spirit. In the middle of the night, when sometimes when real dark things will come. Uh, does it ever visit you in the middle of the night? In that dark thing? I can sit there, and, and yes, it actually is important at some point to sometimes say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. But other times, I, I, I simply, or with that, I will, I will just recite the word of God. And I memorize large portions. If you haven't memorized scripture, you, you need it. it. It's a lifeline to you. In the middle of the night, off I go. I, I've got big chunks 
memorized, and I just start reciting through it. And peace will come, and I'm off <laughs> go to sleep. And I just fall asleep peacefully as the Lord takes and renews my mind. I'm learning practical, simple tools of ways to, when the temptations and pressures come, how do I handle it? My morning time with the Lord. I had it today. I do it not out of piety. See, I did it today. I did it because I don't want the old Steve to walk in here and hurt you. Because he will if he's not in the spirit. The old Steve, the old temperamental, whatever it is, will come in and he'll hurt people and say stupid things. And rather than do that, I would rather meet him in the morning <laughs> and, and let the word fill me and get close to him so that I can come in with a sensitive conscience and try to speak the word of the Lord rather than my word. You follow this? If this is, these, are, these are ways we're learning to simply do what he's talking about. It works. When the at enemy attacks, we know, how the, we know how to use the weapons of our warfare. We daily learn to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. This is what Jesus meant when he said he would set us free. We would be free to obey, free to fulfill God's plan for us. Free to lay up treasure in heaven. Free to bring delight to our heavenly Father's heart. The best news of all isn't that we can keep on sinning and be forgiven. It's that we can stop sinning and start living. Would you say this with me? I am not a slave. Not a slave. Say this. I have all the forgiveness I need. And one more. He that is in me is greater than any sin that has laid hold of me. He that is in me is greater than any sin that has laid hold of me. And one more, I'm free. I am free. Amen. May I have those who come who will assist me in serving. You may come right ahead and take those trays. Here it is. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. He didn't just die for us. We die with him. So that the old nature, all of that is gone. It's dead in Christ. It's a real act. It's a real thing. You and I are now children of God. It may not appear what we are. But we are now children of God. Now. And we're learning to live in those realities. Lord Jesus, open our ears and heart. Soften us as we come to your table. We love you and we believe in you. Lord, we bring to you today. I, I don't think one of us doesn't have sins and failures and shortcomings and illnesses and sadnesses to bring you. But you're able to bear them and take them away from us. You're able to give us forgiveness and wash us, to heal us, and make us strong and give us joy. So we come to you this day, Lord. We come to your table. Thank you for opening our hearts in Jesus' name. When we, when we take communion and we pass the tray, we don't just hand it to the next person. What we do is we hold it for that person, and then we minister communion by saying this, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's practice that. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If you would say that as you hold it while they take it, that would you would be ministering to your brother and sister. We have a few minutes while everyone's receiving. This is time for prayer. It's time to give him the junk. Just confess it freely. No condemnation, but get rid of it. Confess it to him. Give him you can give him your sorrows. Give him your sorrow. Give him your sickness. Just give it to him and receive from him life, forgiveness, and the joy of the Lord. We'll take together in just a few minutes when everyone's served. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. For what I received from the Lord, that I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He was saying, I'm going to die for you tomorrow. I'm going to die on the cross for you. And I am going to bear your sins. I am going to, I'm going to die, and you're going to die with me. And the new covenant and the blessings of God will come to you. As you're ready to say, Lord, I believe you died for me. Would you take the body of Christ broken for you?
He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the new covenant is a specific promise of God in the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah, it's in Ezekiel. It says this, it says that our sins will be remembered no more, but it says that everyone of who's in that new covenant, from the least to the greatest, will all know God. They'll be full of the Holy Spirit. And Ezekiel says so beautifully, He will dwell in us. He will dwell in us. Jesus says, my cross will bring to you the indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit of God. And you will, your sins will be remembered no more. And you will walk with God as children of God. If you believe that, would you drink the cup of the new covenant? Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Lord Jesus, we say to you this day, thank you for all you have done for bearing our sins and our sorrows and our sickness, for dying for us, but we die with you. And we are now raised from the dead. We are now forgiven. We are children of God. We are filled and given the Holy Spirit without measure. We are beloved of the Father, trained and taught as children, being raised into your likeness. We love you. We honor you. We welcome this. And thank you, Lord, for infinite mercy that forgives us over and over again as we learn. We walk and thank you for that mercy. We do not take it for granted. It is our desire to know the truth, and the truth will set us free. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me and pass those cups to the center aisles? Let me remind you that we have communion that can be taken out of the building. Is there someone at home who's sick or shut in? Someone who's depressed? Someone who's just miserable? Why don't you take them communion today? Just say, we took communion at church, thought you might enjoy it. You hardly need to say a word. Communion just shouts its message. Christ's broken body and his shed blood. He couldn't say it better. We have a little card there. It's free. There are baskets of them and a card that uh, tell you what to say. If you need, need that, you're more than welcome to it. Just please consider that. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>